Okay, live stream is up. Sergeant Martinez, will you start the PC recording? PC recording underway. Cloud recording is good. Backup is rolling. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Ayala, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to welcome you to our oversight hearing today on the Office of Financial Empowerment. I am joined today by my colleagues on the committee, council members Kuhl, Chen, Yeager, Menchaca, Kalos, Brennan, and Lander. For more than 10 years, the Office of Financial Empowerment has been a vital source in the financial welfare of New Yorkers. In addition to providing free or low cost financial education and counseling, OFE advocates for policies and legislation that will improve New Yorkers' financial resiliency and works with a broad range of partners to expand access to important financial tools and services. One of the main priorities of OFE has been improving access to mainstream banking. Despite being a hub for international finance, 11% of New Yorkers do not have a bank account. This is nearly double the national average. In some neighborhoods, such as those in the South and Central Bronx and Northern Manhattan, the percentage of unbanked households is over 25%. And now with the pandemic, we are seeing bank branches close. So even for those that have a bank account, getting to a physical branch is even harder. The lack of access to affordable mainstream banking is problematic at the best of times. And the pandemic has only made the issue worse. Without the ability to get stimulus assistance through direct deposit, for example, people have had to wait weeks for checks or preloaded debit cards. If the money comes by check, you, can need, you, need, you then need to find a check processing center and pay to get it cashed. The ripple effects of the economic crisis caused by COVID-19 are endless. The unemployment rate in the Bronx, for example, reflects the cascading effects of income loss can cause. Over the summer, the Bronx has had the highest unemployment rate in the city, 25%. That following October, 20% of Bronx residents applied for SNAP benefits compared to 13% citywide. Further, 10% of Bronx residents visited a food pantry or soup kitchen in October, with 15% indicating that having enough food to eat was their main concern. Without a stable source of income, many New Yorkers were unable to uh, afford their necessities. Although there are moratoriums in place at the moment, a large share of the city's residents have fallen behind on rent and mortgage payments, as well as essential utilities such as gas and electric. These residents are going to owe thousands of dollars once the moratoriums are lifted, but it is unclear how they will afford to pay. The economic impact of the pandemic is being felt across the city. But for those New Yorkers who were already in the precarious financial situation prior to COVID-19, the devastation is heightened. Without substantial savings, unable to access credit, delinquent on debt, or shut out of the banking system, many New Yorkers simply do not have the financial foundation to manage a crisis without experiencing severe economic hardship. There have been various effects by all levels of government to provide assistance, but some of these relief efforts have been marred by pro with problems and at times exacerbated existing racial and um, ethnic inequities. For example, in the initial COVID-19 relief programs administered by the city's small business services, only a small percent of businesses in the Bronx gained access to the money. Of the funds from the Small Business Continuity Loan Fund, 66% went to businesses in Manhattan, 18% went to businesses in Brooklyn, 9% uh, to those in Queens, 5% to those in Staten Island, and less than 1% of the businesses in the Bronx. There was a similar pattern with the money from the Employee Retention Grant Program. 53% went to businesses in Manhattan, 25% went to businesses in Brooklyn, 16% to businesses in Queens, and only 3% of businesses to businesses in the Bronx and Staten Island. 
We simply have to do better. I am encouraged to see that the issue of inequity and existing financial struggle has been a part of the focus of, OF, of OFE's research over the past year or so. And I hope to hear today how we can help alleviate some of the ongoing problems. The COVID-19 pandemic did not cause all of the economic instability facing New, York, New Yorkers today, but it has intensified it. And unfortunately, the negative effects are being felt by those already marginalized. The pandemic has intensified inequalities along racial and ethnic, social economic and neighborhood lines. So it is important that we have this hearing today so that we can plan a comprehensive route to economic stability for all New Yorkers. I'd, like, I'd now like to turn it over to the committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Uh, my name is Josh Kingsley. I'm the committee council. Before we begin testimony today, I wanna to thank everyone for attending and remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony will be the commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, Lorelei Salas. DCWP will also have the following people available for questioning. Nicole Davis, who is the acting commissioner of the Office of Financial Empowerment, and Stephen Etani, who is the executive director of External Affairs. I will call on each of you shortly when it's your time to test give testimony. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes for the panelists to answer your question. Please note that in the case of virtual hearings, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of the questions from the committee chair. Lastly, all hearing participants should submit their written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to the administration. Um, Commissioner Salas, uh, Deputy Commissioner Davis, and Mr. Atani, please raise your hands and I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Salas? I do. Thank you so much. Acting Deputy Commissioner Davis? I do, yes. And Mr. Atani? I do. Thank you all, and you may begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Ayala, members of the committee. I am unmuted, right? Okay. I'm Laura Lee Salas, Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. I am joined today by Nicole Davis, Acting Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Financial Empowerment and Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs. Congratulations, Madam Chair, on your appointment to lead this important committee. I enjoyed our most recent conversation and my staff and I are looking forward to working with you on a range of priorities at this critical time in our city's history. The Office of Financial Empowerment, or OFE, focuses on initiatives that support New Yorkers and communities with low incomes in building wealth and improving their financial health. OFE educates, empowers, and protects residents and neighborhoods with low incomes so they can build assets and make the most of their financial resources. OFE uses data and research, policy, partnerships, and convenings to advance its mission. Using this model, OFE can develop, offer, and advocate for innovative programs and products for all New Yorkers. Since its creation, OFE has been trailblazing a new path and challenging conventional orthodoxy of what municipal government services can and must provide to its constituents. The foresight to create this office and the import of its mission can be summed up in a few ways, but one is particularly telling. In 2006, it was the first of its kind in the nation. Today, there are over 50 models and initiatives built in its likeness, including San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Boston, and Philadelphia. Since OFE remains, um, still OFE remains unique in that its placement within the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection recognizes interconnectedness of financial empowerment with consumer and worker protections. The department leverages OFE's work ultimately to more completely pursue its mission to enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. 
As you know well, in New York City, we're accustomed to leading, and I am excited to give the council an update on how OFE is continuing to do so on a range of issues, including its original and acclaimed research, financial counseling and coaching, outreach to the public, and free tax preparation services. OFE is committed to contributing to research-based policymaking. This philosophy has borne out from legislative and programmatic perspective. OFE's research and reporting of predatory lending in the secondhand auto industry in New York City informed two pieces of legislation passed by council in 2017 to augment consumer protections and bridge language access gaps for residents citywide. Similarly, a first of its kind report and partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York informed the start of a series of student debt clinics in target neighborhoods to help New Yorkers understand their loans and how to repay them. In the case of student debt in particular, its unique burden on individuals, families, and communities has fueled further study into the topic. Drawing on its findings, including a second student debt report that identified indicators of vulnerability, OFE developed a three-part series on borrower populations vulnerable to student loan debt distress. The series includes briefs on New York City veterans, Black borrowers, and borrowers with low incomes. Each installment of the series provides historical and policy context for these constituencies and provides conclusions and actions for them to consider as they make higher education choices. In all, OFE's commitment has inspired other cities like San Francisco and Washington DC to duplicate its research methodology and has enhanced existing citywide financial counseling and coaching modules by incorporating counselor training to manage student debt inquiries and concerns from clients. Economic shocks like COVID-19 and its consequence on low and middle income New Yorkers are stark reminders of the research-based work that remains to be done. Over the past several months, OFE developed a two-part series of briefs to illustrate the broad scale and magnified economic distress on New Yorkers during COVID-19. The first brief, which came out this past September, looked at three key indicators of financial health preparedness, banking access, emergency savings, and credit access. To identify the neighborhoods with the lowest level of financial preparedness, prior to the pandemic, and who is therefore most vulnerable to future economic shocks. The second brief released in December examined the impact of the pandemic-induced recession on New Yorkers in the short term and what can be learned from the Great Recession about potential long-term impacts. These briefs have and will continue to inform advocacy at the federal level as Congress considers more stimulus programs. OFE's research bears out the need for extended, enhanced unemployment and paid leave benefits and underscores the imperative of additional direct payments to those in need. As illustrated by our, our most recent research, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed the financial fragility of millions of vulnerable households. Whether shut out of the mainstream banking system, lacking any rainy day savings, unable to access credit, delinquent on debt, or some combination of these, many New Yorkers lack the financial foundation to manage a crisis without experiencing economic hardship. Seeking out financial counseling and coaching is one affirmative step New Yorkers can take to help navigate financial difficulties. OFE contracts with seven organizations that run five different counseling and coaching programs. These programs include Ready to Rent, a specific counseling service for New Yorkers to prepare to apply for affordable housing, Empowered NYC, a counseling service for New Yorkers with disabilities and their families, and Financial Empowerment Centers, the largest of the programs, which provides free and confidential counseling to anyone over the age of 18 who lives or works in New York City. Prior to New York State on pause, OFE was operating 32 financial empowerment centers across all five boroughs with three additional sites set to open later in March 2020. 
These centers are strategically located in neighborhoods where our research shows a high density of where low income, unbanked and underbanked households reside. Since the inception of the program in 2008, financial empowerment centers have helped clients reduce their debt by over $80 million and accumulate savings over $7 million. Today, due to ongoing health concerns regarding COVID-19, many centers are now closed for in-person services and are providing remote counseling sessions by phone. In either case, however, appointments may still be booked by visiting nyc.gov slash talk money or calling 311. Despite the consequences of New York State pause, counseling and coaching programs have had a steady demand counselors have completed nearly 10,000 appointments across all five financial counseling and coaching programs during this time. And in general, remote counseling appointments have proven to have a higher show rate than in-person appointments. In fact, from March 16th to December 31st, 63% of all scheduled appointments were completed, which is 13% higher than the industry standard for financial counseling. Regarding client needs, historically, most clients seek financial counseling and coaching to help reduce their debt and improve their credit. During the pandemic, this has largely remained to be the case. However, the number of people seeking assistance with benefits, eligibility, and emergency resources, such as food or rental assistance, has risen noticeably. Financial counselors have shared that clients are experiencing acute food insecurity among other financial and emotional crises. Financial counseling is an important resource for clients to manage their finances in uncertain times. Get connected to emergency assistance, avoid scams and predatory products and services, and protect their income and assets. As a result, OFB created a COVID-19 resource guide for counselors to use to direct clients to existing and um, emergency resources for food, shelter, transportation, and health-related matters. OFE leverages DCWP's communications and marketing and external affairs staff to ensure its message reaches New Yorkers. Fact sheets on student loan debt payment relief are found on DCWP's dedicated landing page for information during COVID-19 crisis, nyc.gov slash DCWP alerts. After the passing of the CARES Act, additional tip sheets and guidance were created to assist New Yorkers in securing economic impact payments. As usual, these resources are translated into at least 12 languages and amplified are virtual events coordinated by DCWP staff. DCWP regularly leverages its relationship with stakeholders and sister agencies to amplify OFE's work. Events with the Department for the Aging, New York Immigration Coalition, and the Hispanic Federation are just some examples of the 165 financial empowerment uh, events the agency conducted in 2020. From a marketing perspective, DCWP uh, strategically targets constituencies that may benefit from its programs. In 2020, and in response to COVID-19, DCWP advertised that its counseling services were continuing to be made available over the phone. Targeted media buys focusing um, on expanded language access to Haitian and R Russian New Yorkers and ad buys in subway stations and link NYC kiosks in addition to visiting numerous food pantries and food distribution centers, help to drive consistent intake for our financial counselors. One public awareness campaign that is just getting started is our annual and, uh, New York City Free Tax Prep Program. NYC Free Tax Prep is a free tax preparation service administered and funded by OFE with service delivery through contracted community partners with professional preparation provided by certified IRS tax volunteers. This year, individuals with an income of $48,000 or less and families with an income of $68,000 or less qualify for the program. 
NYC pre-tax prep offers a number of different options for individuals and families to complete their tax returns, including virtual prep or assisted prep over the internet, drop-off, and in-person services. Over the last five years alone, the, um, the historically popular program has completed over 735,000 returns and saved New Yorkers over $110 million in estimated tax preparation fees. Functionally, New York City Free Tax Prep relies heavily on volunteer, temporary, and seasonal tax workers. Prior to the services being disrupted last March during uh, New York State pause, NYC Free Tax Prep providers operated more than 130 sites in all five boroughs and had completed more than 55,000 returns. When in-person services were suspended in accordance with New York State pause, providers discontinued work with their volunteers and temporary employees while they awaited guidance from the IRS on delivering services remotely. While many providers adapted quickly to complete returns online and virtually, services were limited and constituent lack of access to needed equipment and secure internet connection uh, stunted uh, preparation numbers. This tax season, some of the same challenges remain. Lack of access to and comfort with online technology will limit participation of key constituencies. That said, nine of OFE's 15 contractors this year will offer in-person or drop-off services in all five boroughs to help mitigate this issue. Although one in two New Yorkers are eligible for NYC free tax prep, most choose to pay a commercial preparer or use paid online services to complete their tax return. The increased availability and promotion of online tax preparation may attract more eligible New Yorkers to this safe and free option. New York City free tax prep providers also stand ready to assist New Yorkers in claiming the economic impact payments. In 2020, more than 1,100 New Yorkers received assistance in completing the forms to claim the first round of stimulus payments, and we anticipate more will be helped during this tax season. As Congress and the White House discuss additional stim stimulus payments, NYC free tax prep providers are ready to help New Yorkers claim these critical funds. This year, neighborhood marketing, including placing posters in establishments like convenience stores and laundromats, as well as skewing ad purchases to digital outlets and investing resources in targeted zip codes, we anticipate will drive awareness and participation. As I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony, OFE has a bold vision in research, programmatic work, and outreach to the financially vulnerable is a constant and indispensable duty. I am asking the Council to join OFE as a partner in supporting an inclusive and equitable approach to our recovery from COVID-19, an approach that of course addresses the public health challenges facing our city, but also importantly supports financial health resiliency so that New Yorkers can better withstand future economic downturns. That support of course begins with supporting OFE's work I look forward to your questions and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think, you know, obviously there is no doubt that OFB offers a really valuable, uh, you know, resource to New Yorkers. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for today's conversation. I think that I'm really curious to find out um, how we as a council can help ensure that you know our constituencies um, know of the resources available through OFE um, and can help you know with any you know maybe marketing um, opportunities through through our individual offices but I have I have I have quite a few questions um, I will ask a few and then I will defer to my uh, colleagues um, so don't be surprised by that um, but I think so we're seeing we're seeing specifically um, in communities like mine, for example, where I have like in the in the South Bronx, I have like one bank that banking has become, um, you know, a, a, a challenge um, 
and it continues to be a challenge for some communities. Um, I, I think, you know, when we get out of City Hall, we, you know, we, you have access to maybe seven branches, right, you know, within a couple of blocks radius. In some communities, you have none. And now we're seeing more and more branches um, close. Um, not sure if it's COVID related. I'm not sure if it's because more people are banking online. I don't, I don't, I don't yet, you know, understand what the, the, the reason behind the closures is, but wondering if this is something that OFE is looking into and what if anything is OFE doing to prevent the, the closure of uh, bank branches in New York City? Thank you for that question, Chair Ayala. It is definitely one that we are always concerned with, as you know, um, access to banking and safe products uh, is a very important goal of our office. Uh, and we are aware of some branches closing. Um, you know, obviously as, as private actors, we do not have any, any power to require them to remain in those communities. We do have great partnerships with a number of banks that are um, banks that have agreed to accept the IDNYC card, right? So for a long time, we've uh, been working with financial institutions that want to remain in those communities. Um, a couple of things I'll say, and then uh, um, obviously if Nicole Davis can jump in and help me uh, with the answer, that would be great. But um, one thing that we keep an eye on is on any federal advocacy we can do to make sure that we continue to um, advocate for banks to remain in those communities. Uh, for instance, the Community Reinvestment Act, there were proposed changes to the act uh, in the last few months. And OFE, together with, uh, I believe, HPD um, and, and City Hall in general, um, it opposed some of the changes that would have actually diluted even more um, the requirements for these banks to invest in the communities that need uh, this uh, resources. Um, so we are um, hopefully, um, we're hopeful for a, a new administration, they may take a different approach and actually strengthen the Community Reinvestment Act instead of diluting it. Um, I know also that in the past, as part of our community wealth building and as part of our neighborhood financial health research, we've worked with groups um, in different neighborhoods. Um, we worked uh, in the past with a, a group, a community-based organization in Brooklyn and one in Harlem to test out different ways to encourage uh, community members to um, basically uh, identify the, the challenges they had in accessing uh, safe financial products, for instance. And in Harlem, uh, we work closely with, um, it wasn't a community bank, uh, Nicole, you can correct me on that. It was um, a CDFI, I, I forgot exactly the term for it. It was Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union. A credit union, right? To to figure out, you know, uh, what are what is one way in which we could be encouraging more um, uh, traffic from community members to the credit union, and we engaged with um, what we call um, peer uh, promoters or promotoras in Spanish, uh, who uh, they themselves were members from the communities who that is under bank or in bank, and they opened their accounts and they were uh, credible uh, vehicles for bringing information to their neighbors, to the people they encounter at the schools, to talk about um, the importance of opening an account um, in, um, in a credit union where there may be very low fees in accessing your money and take away that incentive to go to a check casher, for instance, right? And um, it was a pilot program, but we compared the numbers of uh, new accounts open um, during the period that the promotoras were working in the community versus the year before. And the numbers were great. I think the increase was close to 50% more accounts open. So it's something that works, right? At least it worked for that community, uh, for that specific need, wanting to drive more traffic to the credit union. Um, but Nicole, if there's anything else you want to add to this issue, to this um, question. Absolutely. You know, one of the products that the Office of Financial Empowerment um, helped to create was the NYC Safe Start account, which is a safe and affordable bank account with terms that were identified, you know, before and then, you know, an RFP to help uh, collect participants in it. Um, 
it was to help New Yorkers set up a savings account with no overdraft fees, no monthly fees, provided that a minimum balance uh, was kept, uh, low minimum balance requirements, $25 or less, and an ATM card. Um, and so our work with financial institutions to provide that you know, is one way that we can you know, advocate for New Yorkers to have access to banking. Um, other ways, you know, in addition to what the commissioner shared about the CRA comments, is partnering with community-based organizations and um, looking at different research. So there are groups that have looked at the presence of CDFIs in a community as leading to more investment in small businesses. And so working with them to learn from their research and also advocate whenever we have the opportunity to um, speaking to our peer you know, offices at the state level and hopefully under this administration at the, the federal level as well. I, I also just want to um, mention one thing since Nicole is speaking about state level advocacy is that our 2015 partnership with the Urban Institute that really uh, fueled a lot of the statistics about on and under banking in New York City, that report was often cited not only in our own advocacy in Albany, but also amongst our partners like the New Economy Project and others that for the first time in I believe a couple, since it's founding in 2007, the CDFI fund was appropriated money um, in the New York state budget just a couple of years ago. So our, that's just a tangible example of how our research has led to real um, you know, results for uh, to kind of close gaps in this case, particularly on and under banking. Let me just finish um, this part by um, connecting it to the financial counselors, right? Uh, opening a, a bank account is one of the, the number one things that a counselor can assist uh, um, a client uh, who's working on their financial health, right? So it is part of what the counselors do all of the time, helping uh, individuals begin to build assets and, and opening a, a savings account, a bank account is the first, one of the first steps they help uh, clients with. Um, I mean, and I think that the credit counseling is obviously is really important. I find that, you know, most people um, that, you know, in, in my community are not opening bank accounts because either a bank is not existent, a credit union is not existent, or because they also maybe have credit issues, right, that prevent them from being able to open an account in the first place because they're afraid, um, and rightly so, that their account could be frozen because maybe they have credit card debt, uh, maybe they have, you know, child support issues. Uh, are these some of the issues that you're, you know, encountering? Are these some of the, 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 the reasons for why a person would be coming in contact with OFE? And also, if you can explain to me, how does a person um, know uh, that these, these services exist in the first place? Um, you mentioned community-based organizations um, being a source of, uh, of, of referrals, but how do, you, how do you ensure that you're connecting with um, individuals that should know that these services exist? Like, are you uh, partnering with HRA? Are you in WIC offices? Are you, uh, you know, able to do maybe hair salons and just places where you would come in contact with the community that we would want to make sure um, knows and understands that these services are available? Yes. Um, so first I will say that uh, a number of our clients come to us when, um, they are at a time where they have to make a decision often or they are in crisis, right? Um, uh, clients come to us when they, they just cannot manage their debt anymore. Um, that is one of the big drivers for seeking financial counseling. I can't manage my debt or my credit is really terrible. I want to buy a house or I want to even just apply for an apartment and be able to show I have good credit. So those are the um, the counselors are, it's almost like the bread and butter for them to work on helping people reduce their debt, tackle their debt, and also um, um, improve their credit scores, um, build savings. And um, so so certainly that is, that is one of the, um, I think the biggest concerns for clients coming in into our centers, um, managing their debt. Our counselors um, they will get on the phone if they have to, if they can be of help with sometimes negotiating some of the medical debt our 
clients bring with them, right? These are individuals who are uh, professional, confidential services. It's really fantastic. It really is fantastic. I tell people I went through that service many years ago when I worked for um, a nonprofit organization because the issues of economic instability are affecting a lot of people, not just people who are earning very, very low incomes, but even people who are managing, you know, both large student loan debt and um, a, an annual salary that should be paying for uh, your expenses, right? So so I visited someone who uh, was uh, is part of this network, actually, and I have seen myself uh, what it means to have someone can hold you through that process when you feel judged, when you feel like, you know, embarrassed that you're tackling all of these uh, uh, financial uh, problems. So it's certainly an amazing resource. And we do the outreach for the program in a million different ways. I mean, if you have any suggestions, we're happy to take them. We are doing both uh, marketing campaigns uh, with done uh, really great public awareness campaigns in our subways, in our um, buses. We have, we always work with elected officials and make sure that they all have the information uh, that they can provide to their, um, to their constituencies. Um, one thing that I always tell people when I am talking people one-on-one -on -one and over this past summer, uh, when, you know, you would see those very, very long lines of people waiting for food distribution. We went to those lines and talked to every single person standing on the line and gave them the information about our financial empowerment centers um, because that's who needed it the most, right? So we use one-on-one, -on -one, you know, on the ground outreach. We use uh, communicating via elected officials, community boards, um, you name it. And so uh, definitely working with other agents in partnership. In fact, um, you know, the core financial counseling and coaching program has in the last few years, we've sort of uh, gone into more depth into certain like uh, issues or um, specific populations that needed um, even um, a program that was um, even more nuanced with respect to their needs. So for instance, we have, as I mentioned earlier, our Empower NYC program, where we work very closely with the Mayor's Office of uh, People with Disabilities to uh, make sure that um, people with disabilities who are um, interested in, in, in you know, um, earning an income or finding a job are able to do those things to improve their financial health without putting at risk their eligibility for key medical benefits, right? Uh, so our, our counselors were trained to be able to identify those very important issues that uh, they need to watch out for. Uh, like, um, yeah, anyway, that's one um, one program. We have a program, as Nicole mentioned, the Ready to Rent program, which is funded by the council, uh, where we help people get ready to apply for affordable housing. That is a program that we definitely have seen a lot of demand even during the last year. We have our counselors like fully scheduled for those appointments. So there's a lot of interest in that. Um, and then the student loan debt program is another way in which we um, um, you know, our research helped to identify those neighborhoods where we had a lot of distress, uh, a lot of defaults. Uh, the Bronx was one, uh, you know, it has like four or five different neighborhoods where we saw a lot of uh, stress from student loan borrowers. And we spent uh, a lot of time in the community doing listening sessions, talking to people, but also then putting together the student loan debt clinics, where all we did was first, you know, help you with that immediate issue that you have. You want to be able to access uh, some of the existing repayment programs that exist at the federal level that are very complicated to navigate, right? So we have a counselor who can handhold you through that and then make sure that you continue to work on your financial health by looking at your budget, looking at whether you have a savings account, right? So um, definitely very strong partnerships. Uh, um, the Taxi Limousine Commission is another agency with whom we're partnered very closely for the Drivers Resource Center. So while TLC manages the daily operations of the center, uh, the contracts for the legal services provider and for the co coaching are through our office. So that is another uh, another more recent program or variation of the financial count. Uh, so do you, Commissioner, do you, do you work with um, 
do you work with local community, you know, with uh, community colleges, for instance? I remember when I was a student at community college, I was, you know, on public assistance and, you know, um, not in debt yet, but I remember being very vulnerable uh, to institutions that would sit and camp out in front of the, uh, the campus, right? And I, I can, I remember, and I share this story uh, frequently, uh, coming out of, uh, out of school one day with uh, a few um, a, a few schoolmates and there was a, they were offering credit cards in front of the school mm -hmm. they were giving away I think it was like skittles and m and ms and mm -hmm. you know as an incentive for applying and we thought well let's you know let's apply nobody's gonna in their right mind is gonna give us a credit card like we don't have any money so we apply we get the free candy we walk away and then voila like a few weeks later I got a you know my first credit card in the mail was like seven hundred dollars and I remember thinking, Oh, wow. I, you know, I didn't think I, I would qualify and I really, really needed a sofa and I bought a sofa with my $700 and then I, you know, attempted to make, you know, regular payments, but as a parent, a single parent on public assistance, it became harder and harder. And that's where my credit card debt, you know, uh, history started, right. It's not really knowing I was maybe 19, 20 years old. Um, and there, there, you know, so I wonder like, would it be, I would find, yeah. I would think that it would be really um, helpful to have these, these services, right, uh, offered at the community colleges. Um, in colleges, period, where a lot of young people that are not yet, right, um, experienced enough to understand um, the impacts, the long-term impacts, right, of continuing to borrow, um, you know, will have on their lives. Yeah, thank you for that question. Certainly, so one thing I would say that the only requirement for uh, to be uh, eligible for free financial counseling uh, in New York City, if you work or live in New York City, you have to be 18 years of age or older, right? Because you need to consent to um, us having to access to your credit score, your private information. Um, and we do believe that uh, financial literacy, financial education needs to start very young, right? Even before one goes off to college. In fact, making the decision to go to college is a huge financial uh, decision that may have consequences uh, for a lot of people who, you know, have to borrow money to go to school. So we're very interested in working and collaborating and have done so in the past. Uh, LaGuardia Community College um, comes to mind just because I myself have gone there to present in front of some of the students in their classes, but also talked to the leadership about uh, making sure that we are um, Either, even if we don't have a, a counselor at the center, at the, at the college campus itself, that there's a very easy uh, connection, uh, um, relationship of referrals uh, uh, to our centers. Um, and I believe we may have a center very close to La Guardia Community College, for instance. But the idea is that our centers are in places where a community, you know, the, where there's the highest need. So it's likely that, for instance, in the Bronx, that even if you don't have a center at your school or a counselor at your school, like right now, I can tell you that uh, there are four in-person sites that are open in the Bronx uh, because our counselors are very committed to this work and they, they know they want to be able to be present for, for their community. So um, it is definitely, uh, we also have a, um, a huge interest in uh, higher public education because we have seen uh, the devastating effect of, of students who, you know, sometimes enter into, um, they borrow a lot of money to go to school and um, it sometimes what, you know, the increase in their income after graduation is not really going to uh, result in, a, in an increase in income uh, in general because of the debt that they carry, right? But in, in my in, in my opening remarks, I, I referenced the uh, the fact that so so little of the businesses in the South Bronx and in Northern Manhattan qualified for um, small business relief funds. And I wonder how has the how has OFE worked with the individual and small businesses in getting access to various government assistance programs. Um, and are you focusing on those communities specifically that did not qualify um, and that received so little of these funds? So I will tell you first about, I'll answer your second question first. Um, 
our centers, I mean, for the last 10 years that we've been focused on the financial health of New Yorkers and we've been working on our research around underbanked and unbanked communities, right? Our priorities have always been to to be present in those communities where we need to be um, bringing more interventions and opportunities for uh, residents to, again, uh, become financially stronger. So uh, it's no surprise that um, actually during COVID-19, when we saw the initially during the first phase, the 27 neighborhoods that were the highest um, impacted by uh, COVID-19 infection rates are some of the same neighborhoods where we have our financial empowerment centers and where our counselors are working uh, every day. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, commonality between like what we have seen post-COVID-19 are, are the neighborhoods where we need to be investing more in order to really think about um, a recovery that's equitable. Um, and those neighborhoods where we already knew we needed to be um, investing our resources in. Um, so so, there, so there's that, like, I think we start from the premise that uh, our work has been already uh, directed to these areas. In terms of small businesses, um, so I know that we have uh, a small um, program uh, that actually uh, does help small businesses with financial counseling. Uh, and we also have the investment in the TLC um, driver resource center. Um, but I'm not sure that Nicole, Nicole, that if we have had any other sort of touch with small businesses with respect to their avail- um, ability to access some of these small business loans um, or the relief from the federal government. So the financial counselors um, at the financial empowerment centers have mentioned there's either confusion or questions or a need for assistance in applying for some of these small business specific you know, uh, relief programs. Um, and so we were able to get some great information from other partners in the city about where exactly we should be referring those small businesses. Um, our financial counselors could not help someone complete Um, you know, that type of application or like a benefits application, for example. Um, So there have been referrals out, um, as the commissioner mentioned, with the Driver Resource Center. There has been, because of that center's purpose, there has been significant uh, uh, work with medallion owners and other for hire vehicle drivers to um, apply for and um, receive those benefits and those resources. Um, The commissioner mentioned we have a very small program um, that is mostly about raising awareness with small business owners that financial counseling is available to them. Mm -hmm. And so we have had some small business owners come to the financial empowerment centers, you know, to, you know, look at, for so many small business owners, micro entrepreneurs, they use their own personal credit in order to qualify for business credit. Um, And so that can be uh, a difficult to untangle So we have seen some of that, um, but given the complexity of these applications, there has been, we've had to refer out to resources or, you know, directly to their bank um, to, you know, for the PPP loans. The financial counselors are great at helping someone pull together all of the documents that they may need and learning how to like access different documents that they may have trouble finding or needing to get replaced. Have a guest. Yeah. It's okay. it's okay, you can leave them. We love cats. Um, but does OFE play a role in, in advocating on behalf of the, like, in communicating the complexities of these, applica- these applications and how, you know, how difficult it is for small business owners or taxi medallion, um, you know, uh, holders to understand and, and, and kind of navigate? Because I don't, I think that that was one of the issues was that there really was not that support system built into our communities. And so, um, you know, you can see the disparities are very clear. I mean, the fact that Manhattan uh, small businesses receive 66% of, you know, of, of these, uh, these grants and, and loans um, is pretty significant. And I would, I would wager that, you know, the bulk of the 66% were on the southern part of the island and not on the northern part of the island. 
um, because it's what I'm hearing from small businesses. But I have I have a I have a bunch of, of questions, but I don't want to be dismissive of my colleagues, and I want to be um, aware of their time. I believe that uh, Council Member Ku was next. Had a question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Ayala. Yeah. Uh, hello, Commissioner. How are you? Yeah. How can, hi, Council Member. Yeah, I have a question. You say like your uh, Office of Financial Empowerment (OFE), right? How many staff you have? I mean, how many councillors or how many different offices you have? Yes. So, um, the on staff we have uh, it, the, the department. The division is a small office. It's supposed to have twenty staffers in my office. There's actually five vacancies right now, including the deputy commissioner's role. So uh, we're down to fifteen people uh, in the office. But the work that we're doing of financial counseling and the free tax preparation services, for instance, is all work done via contracts with community-based organizations and service providers, right? So uh, these the counselors are hired by these uh, organizations that uh, participated in an uh, RFP process with the city and who were awarded contracts, right? Typically, they're three-year contracts. Um, and uh, the role that we provide on staff is our office does a lot of the coordination. We do a lot of the program uh, supervision, uh, trainings of the counselors. We are always trying to make sure that our services are accessible to all the communities and that there's a uniformity to it. And obviously another very important role is to continuously update the counselors on new developments, especially post COVID-19. There, there were a lot of relief programs as we all know, and many of them had complicated applications processes. And so our counselors were armed with um, um, the, you know, the most up-to-date information on benefits uh, alleged, uh, uh, available both at the city level, the state level, and the federal level. So uh, there are 35, um, at least uh, before uh, COVID-19, there were 35 centers across the city. Right now, like I said, most of them are doing uh, virtual services, but many are anxious to go back to in-person. Um, and so, um, so that's how the program runs. So what is the budget for this office? Yes, so there is about, um, let me just look at my number, seven million or so, yes. Um, $7.8 million is the total OFE budget. 99% of the budget is going to programs and contracts, right? So 99% of that budget actually goes into the communities, right? Um, uh, most of that money is either either with the financial empowerment centers um, or the free tax preparation service providers that get the funding through our office. So how many how many offsite uh, like like contractors you have like community based uh, organizations? Yeah. So um, let me just get my notes. Um, so for the, the financial empowerment center, right? Because there are two distinct programs. Uh, like I said, for the financial empowerment center, we have um, th 35 uh, centers, right? Again, like right now it's a combination of some that are open in person and others that are doing virtual, right? 35 centers, but I believe it's um, seven organizations that have this funding and they operate the different centers. Is that correct, Nicole? Like, so we have five organizations oh, five. under the Financial Empowerment Center contract that operate those 35 locations. We have, work with two additional um, nonprofit providers, excuse me, um, two additional to run and the other financial counseling programs that we have. And then under the NYC free tax prep contract, we have 15 providers across the city. Okay. Because it's kind of like, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard too much about this uh, OFE, you know, mm -hmm. until today, because I know we have a consumer protection agency. I didn't know we have an office of financial empowerment so I was thinking about like how you 
how we best use the money to educate the, the public about your services, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and how do we measure the performance, you know, whether we are using the money correctly, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, so just wanna, ahead, yeah. I just want to note that uh, as the commissioner mentioned, a major, an overwhelming majority, 99% of the, the budget of this office goes directly to uh, right. contracts and, and community providers that, that are actually delivering the services in various constituencies in all five boroughs. A small number of that budget includes campaigns and marketing. And then a, 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 a critical piece, which I oversee in external affairs, is working with council members like yourself, council member Koo, um, to kind of uh, put on virtual events. So I'm, I'm here to give you an offer. Um, we're happy to, to put on a, a, an event, um, you know, given all COVID-19 protocols and everything virtual uh, to, to let folks in your constitu constituency know about these, these programs. Right now we have free tax prep happening and you know, one in two New Yorkers qualify. Uh, flushing is no no exception to that uh, for sure. So we'd love to let folks know about our programs and and uh, make sure that that our services are are being communicated to your constituents directly. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, what, flushing is a really particular special area. We have a lot of people who live here, but they were oh, they were out of state. And they come back here and, and they, once a week uh, to, uh, to on their day off. And so a lot of them, they will service. You know, they don't really have a paycheck. I mean, they don't have a W-2 form. So a, a lot of them, they have a, a, a problem during this pandemic because you know, when you were in their saloon or when you were as uh, massage parlors, you know, uh, hair directors, a lot of times, they don't really get a real W-2 form. So, uh, and they cannot claim uh, uh, this, whatever the, the, what do you call those PP, uh, the federal stimulus money, right? So I hope you guys can tell them uh, how to apply for their, uh, uh, their, their entitled share, you know? Because it's really confusing because they don't really like, have a W-2 and then, and then their business is closed now. Right, so they. I hope you guys can help them. Uh, the small, small individual uh, people, uh, uh, they are looking for jobs, and they are uh, they are under tremendous financial hardship. Yeah. So thank you very much for your service. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. I I'll, I'll make sure I contact you to arrange something virtually, uh, and see whether you can do something for the Queens area. We'd be happy to. We'd be happy to, and to think about like the specific needs in um, in Flushing residents. Um, happy to do that. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Time starts now. Um, thank you, Chair. I just uh, and thank you for the the testimony. Um, what I wanted to uh, follow up on is that. I know, you know, the, the severe budget cut, and I hope um, that the, um, your department will be spared so that these kind of programs will continue, especially when you talk about 99% of the budget um, goes to uh, community organization um, to help um, different communities. My question is that, you know, in the Asian community, we have a lot of banks, right? But the problem is that they don't really provide that much investment back in the community. Uh, and a lot of the small businesses were not able uh, to get the PPA loan or they were having problems versus it was the CDFI um, that really helped a lot of the uh, small businesses to access um, these government benefits or uh, to provide them with low interest loan uh, which is critical. And I know that you talked about earlier, you mentioned, you know, about advocating with the state and the first time they allocated the money, but that money hasn't come down yet. <laughs> that 25 million that I hear, you know, our representative talk about, not a dime has come down uh, to New York City. So the CDFI is, is something that the organization that we really have to support and advocate and I think the city needs to also 
make some investment because they are the, really the one that's helping out a lot of the small businesses. And so I think that is uh, critical. The other thing I wanted to ask was, was there any study done uh, by your office about um, fees that these banks charge? Like for example, we have a lot of banks in the Asian community, but they're all these hidden fees, you know? And uh, when people ask them to write a letter, uh, they, they need to apply for affordable housing, they have to pay a fee to get a, a, a letter saying how much money they have in the bank or, um, so, I mean, though, those things are, are hidden and it's really causing a lot of you know, money uh, for low income uh, family and especially for seniors. And oftentimes, you know, they have to get some uh, documentation and so I think we have to look at um, one is that, and the other one is that in terms of some of your program, how are you working with NYCHA residents uh, on these issues? Because like, for example, in lower Manhattan, in Chinatown, we have so many banks, but the NYCHA residents are not utilizing them because a lot of them don't have, you know, special program cater uh, to low income residents. Um, that maybe a credit union uh, would do. Thank you, you um, Council Member Chin, you raised very, very important points. Um, if we had our dream at OFV, um, uh, resourcing the CDFIs has been the number one priority for us. It's something we continue to advocate um, again. Um, and obviously we would be very interested in seeing a huge influx of funding for them because as you, you're right, they are the ones who will be providing loans to uh, small businesses, right? Um, and I would say that in terms of fees charged by banks, we certainly have looked at that in detail. I'm not sure that we have ever published something, um, but we have some internal uh, work that we've done, uh, evaluating sort of like what fees are, what seems like um, certainly there are some institutions that are uh, more generous and don't charge as many fees as others, right? Um, and we can talk about that, maybe about whether we can uh, get more information on, on what we found. Um, and then, Nicole, I don't know if there's something you want to add to that and to the NYCHA working relationship. Yeah, I think I'm hearing, like, a, like a, I don't know if it's some interference. Are you hearing that as well, Martinez? I am. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Sounds like uh, a news report going on in the background. Yeah. Okay. So in addition to what the commissioner shared, um, we do work with NYCHA um, in a number of ways. So first would be in the Empowered NYC program, most specifically, when we looked, uh, did research to understand where New Yorkers with disabilities lived, the majority of New Yorkers with disabilities do also reside in NYCHA. And so a lot of our work has been targeted at meeting those New Yorkers, you know, in those communities near where they reside. And that is one area. Another area is with Jobs Plus. So we work with NYCHA, HRA, and NYC Opportunity on the Jobs Plus program. We provide technical assistance on the financial counseling side of, of Jobs Plus. And we also work closely with NYCHA Reese to distribute a lot of information on the services, and we include a tax prep information on a NYCHA rent bill every year. Are you done? Can you unmute Council Member Chen? Yeah, I mean, I could follow up with your office because I also have to get on a, a briefing call, which is happening at the same time. Because this, this hearing was originally scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning and then it got changed on my schedule. But thank you, Commissioner. We definitely will follow up with your office, maybe doing some virtual programming. And then the other thing is really utilizing our ethnic newspaper to really publish, publicize information, um, you know, good news stories and, and sort of like cases, case study, so that people will get the information and say, oh, I could do that too if somebody got some, you know, good uh, counseling uh, advice that can also help them. So that's the resource 
um, that could be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank Good you. Good seeing you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Are there any other council members with questions? Okay. I see none. Okay. Um, so have, has, has OFC seen an, seen an increase of people that are reaching out to the office since the shutdown or are you seeing a decrease? Um, I mean, we saw a steady demand for our services across all of the financial coaching programs. I mentioned earlier that especially in the ready to rent uh, program uh, funded by the city. We saw a lot of interest in uh, individuals who wanted to get ready to uh, apply for affordable housing. Um, so certainly the demand is there. Uh, I think what, um, like I said, what, it, what has changed a little bit has been the nature of the concerns, right, uh, that individuals bring to the counseling. In the past, you know, we were talking to people about um, building their savings, right, tackling their debt, and now it was much more about survival mode, right? Where can you get food for free? Where, you know, is there, um, you know, what programs are there to help you right now? We A big piece of um, the counseling is also about educating consumers, New Yorkers, to not fall prey to uh, actors who may be trying to take advantage of a crisis, right? We've heard about people being told, oh, you can, we, I can get you this benefit if you pay a fee. You should not have to pay at all for any type of government benefit. So we provide that role to of saying like, look, um, what is it that you're hearing? Oh, you're getting offers for this. Well, let me like, you know, explain it to you. Let's go over this together, right? Um, or people didn't know that they could access food at a school or a center and no one would ask them for any proof of identity, right? So these are things that are really are, have been very important. Uh, other, other things like, um, like I said, a student loan debt relief as part of the CARES Act um, is in information that our New Yorkers need. Uh, we also, during the pandemic, um, with our consumer protection um, arm, we decided to uh, put together a template for uh, New Yorkers that were getting calls and letters from debt collection agencies during the pandemic. Um, and we have a rule in place that says that consumers can request a collection agency to cease uh, communicating with them um for specific reasons and because of the pandemic we decided this is obviously a moment when we don't want new yorkers to be even more burdened by these collection agencies so we put this template together so people could just print it and send it and in that way if an agency then tried to contact you to collect on a debt they would be in violation of the rule right so uh this is something that again our counselors were trained to help people with and uh another way to really help allevi alleviate the most immediate urgent needs of New Yorkers during COVID-19. Okay. I appreciate that, Commissioner, but according to the fiscal 2020 mayor's, uh, mayor's management report, the number of New Yorkers served by OFE's financial counseling programs uh, had decreased over the past few years. In fiscal year 2018, over 10,000 New Yorkers were served, while in fiscal year 2020, under 7,000 were served. Can you explain why the numbers are trending downward when the need for such services has drastically increased because of the pandemic? Yeah, so, I mean, certainly with the pandemic um, in March, a lot of our in-person services closed, right? And we had a period of time where we had to work with our centers to both adapt to virtual online services. I mean, it's not something that we were doing before. Um, it's not something that we were used to as part of our own services at the agency, but certainly the financial empowerment centers relied on in-person uh, counseling sessions. Um, it's, it's also a process of building trust, right? A lot of our clients really were initially very, very uh, reluctant to engage in virtual counseling um, because there's no way to connect with the individual in person. Uh, there are a number of forms that you need to sign, actually, uh, and be able to, at least now, we're set up to be able to do that virtually. But in order to provide consent so we can access your personal information, uh, individuals need to sign paperwork. And like I said, there was definitely a transition period done when uh, 
our counseling services were suspended, right? And a period of time when we finally adapted to the virtual counseling work. So um, we but have- How yeah. are you doing, so then how are you, how, how do you connect with individuals that are not, that don't have access to the internet or that may not have a smartphone? Because we, you know, I, and we share a similar issue, right? Our offices uh, provide, um, you know, constituent services to hundreds of, you know, uh, uh, of thousands of families annually. And when, you know, uh, to transitioning to virtual uh, services was a little bit tricky at first, but, you know, we were able to have a, a, a phone line that redirected to the staff so that the staff was able to communicate. And a lot of the city agencies were very accommodating. So if you needed to submit documentation, then they were, they, you know, they were being very flexible on what they were requiring of people because we you know we also understand that there's a real digital divide in this city which further right adds to the complexities of you know trying to reach out to people especially the neediest of people and you know during in a time, time of need right most specifically during the pandemic so for me it was really important that as soon as we could open right that there was someone here physically and i found that you know we were one of the only offices that were open um, citywide, and so we were getting constituents that were coming in from as far as Queens because they had documents that they needed to to fax to someone that they couldn't, and they couldn't, they didn't have access to a fax machine, they didn't have access to internet, they didn't have access to you know the equipment necessary. And the unfortunate part of it is that these are, these are families that were dependent on government aid, right? And so uh, you know they were afraid that they were going to lose their SNAP benefits, right? A time where food insecurity is like at the at, at its highest. Uh, people were losing their jobs and they couldn't apply for unemployment, right? Um, so, you know, the, it was there was a real value in opening the office, uh, albeit, you know, we had to figure out creatively how do we open an office in the midst of a pandemic and do it in an environment that is safe for the staff and for the, you know, individuals coming in to seek um, services, but there was a need. So I, I just wonder if that has contributed to the decrease um, that you're seeing mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, has the, how, how has OFC, you know, um, has OFC even considered, you know, alternatives for addressing those disparities? Yes. And uh, I'll start with addressing the issue of um, um, a lot of our services, like I said, most of these contracts are provided by organizations on the ground in those neighborhoods that need it most, right? quite a number of those host sites, the, the sites where the counselors were giving counseling before, the sites themselves closed, right? So these are nonprofit organizations who quickly shifted many cases to only providing food distribution where every other service was canceled, suspended because they, were, they themselves were trying to adapt to this new world of how do we do this safely, right? In a way that is going to protect people's safety and health without discontinuing the services. So, so that was definitely a challenge. We're having a combination of like the safety and health concerns and then the host sites closing down, shutting down for months. Um, and in that case, not having the, that space available in the community so a client could walk in and bring their paperwork and sit down with someone face to face, right? So we, we right now, uh, we are really happy to be able to, to say that, you know, we've begun reopening those centers. Um, in addition to having the virtual and the phone counseling sessions, our partners recognize how important it is to provide the in-person services. So we four open in the Bronx, one in Queens, and more will be reopening as we go forward. Uh, but that's certainly uh, something that we need to keep working towards. And we've done a lot of work to help them to make sure that they they know, you know, like following the social distancing guidelines, the washing the hands, all of the things that we have to do in our own office to be able to provide services through our licensing center, for instance, we have to see the public. So there's no way, right? So we have to be open. So trying to convey to them these are safe ways in which you can reopen and they were always essential businesses organizations so they had you know a mission to 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 meet but Nicole do you want to say anything else about how we have kind of uh, adapted our services to make sure that clients who don't have access to technology um, are able to access the services absolutely so in addition to what the commissioner shared you know for NYC free tax prep 
Thankfully, we've been able to provide a level of what we call drop-off tax prep. So you can leave your documents, you sign the IRS forms that you need to, um, and you can do it in and out rather quickly. Several groups are even scheduling appointments for that. So it can even, sp even spend less time in lines. We recently just approved and our financial empowerment centers are looking for ways to implement a similar idea for financial counseling. We're calling it intake meetings where you can meet your financial counselor. Perhaps you were there for tax prep already and it's a good idea for you to meet with a financial counselor. So that was just approved. We wanna try it out for the next couple of months and see if that is an option. Um, and of course, if a New Yorker calls 311, they can learn about the services. Um, but we're hoping that these sort of drop-off options will really help reduce some of those barriers that we're keeping New Yorkers who either don't have the technology, aren't comfortable with the technology, or maybe don't have access to stable Wi-Fi or internet, help them access those services. I also just want to just make a note. I, I would definitely want to caution the council to read of reading too too much into the the recent numbers. I mean, I think COVID nineteen presented such a unique challenge, uh, particularly as it affected programs like financial counseling. I mean, when you have already um, barriers to entry to get folks to enter into counseling and coaching, and then on top of that, you have uh, places where people congregate to have uh, services like internet access or access to a computer that are closed, namely our public libraries in New York City that are still closed. Um, those do affect the numbers. It is in no way a reflection of the uh, viability of that program, the popularity of that program, and whatever advertising numbers that we had most recently in COVID, those, number, uh, those, those financials were dedicated directly to targeted communities, as the commissioner mentioned, particularly to Russian and Haitian communities uh, uh, to reflect our expanded access um, in those constituencies, but also to drive uh, awareness that those services were offered over the phone. Um, so uh, as, as I mentioned to council member Koo, um, I would, you know, the offer is obviously staying for any council member, including you chair, um, for, you know, folks in my division and external affairs, certainly uh, the commissioner and Nicole and, and whomever else to have a continued dialogue and certainly prevent, uh, present to your constituents to make them um, aware of, of services that are currently happening in your constituencies and that they can take advantage of. I, I appreciate that and in no way, you know, um... Do I think that you know OFE does not have the capacity? And I, you know, I, I I get it that that you know times have changed, and you know we're all trying to adapt. My concern is that even you know as the and I and I love this program. I think that you know um, it should you know it should be everywhere, right? Every every district should have um, an office. However. You know, my concern is right that as we're adapting to virtual, and as we, and if we are in fact seeing a decrease, um, and the decrease can easily be explained away by the fact that we're all transitioning virtually, that offices have been closed. What is the strategy, right? Is somebody saying, okay, there's a there's a group of of people um, in these communities that you know uh, we've we've lost you know contact with, or that you know no longer can no longer find us because now they may be going to this specific office and the office is closed. I will, you know, I, I, in all honesty, I don't have, I don't ever remember having had a conversation about services and benefits offered through OFE um, at my office, right? And this is, this is like, we engage with, uh, you know, dozens of, of people annually. So it's a missed opportunity um, to not engage with the local elected officials um, in that way. I think, you know, I, it's no criticism, but just, you know, I, the way that I've, I've just realized that, you know, and we're all aware of the inequities that exist in communities of color, but if we've learned anything is like, we're starting to, you know, I, I sit here and I don't, you know, I don't sit in, in meetings all day. I like to engage with my constituents as well. And I find that the, the families that need the resources the most are the, are the, the biggest disadvantage. 
because they don't have access to the computer because they show up to an office and the office is closed and there's no notification that says, hey, we, you know, we're not here anymore if you don't have, you know, but you can call us at this number, right? You don't need a computer. You don't need, you know, you can, you can easily call us um, at this number and we will, you know, try our best to work with you. I think that um, a lot of that, you know, kind of disappeared and, and it's unfortunate, right? Um, because we are the institutions that are put in place in these communities, right, to offer those resources. And so when we left, we took that, that, that option from them. Um, and I, you know, I, I understand, like, there were health concerns for staffers, for, you know, ourselves, like, everybody wanted for the people that were, who were seeking services, and we wanted to make sure that we did that. Um, and we, we provided services safely. And I applaud you, because, I mean, if you went from, you know, that means you still service 7,000, right? That's, that's, that's still 7,000 people that, that were able to, to gain access, but we want to be able to help build off of that. Um, and now that we're coming into a year, right, um, of this pandemic, that hopefully we've stabilized enough that we're, you know, uh, broadening our uh, marketing approach so that we are communicating in those communities where the office hasn't opened. Um, with those constituencies as well. So I offer my services as well. I, you know, I'm happy to help share the information. I'm happy to host uh, virtual to have, you know, to share information with my nonprofit um, organizations. But, you know, I've been there. I've, I've been on the receiving end. And I know that, you know, the last thing on my mind is to, you know, to, to look up and, and Google uh, information, right? Um, that when you're trying to survive and you're trying to feed your family and you're trying to work that, you know, sometimes it takes that chance encounter with information. And that's why it's important that the information be plastered, right? In all of those places that we frequent, whether that be check cashing uh, institutions, whether that be the laundry, you know, mats, places that people frequent um, so that they do come in contact with it and that they have an option. Um, because for too many of them, we removed the option because we just simply were not there. That's that's all that I you know um, I will say. But in terms of, so just um, I, what one of the things that we've also seen during the pandemic is that uh, the number of uh, scams um, seems to have have increased um, specifically in the older adult population and around stimulus payments. A lot of you know our constituents are getting calls um and 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 text alerts hey call this number you know we owe you money have you seen an increase in those types of, of complaints um i i won't say that you know what we see them all the time unfortunately right i think um i don't have numbers for you on the number of you know complaints so i can't tell if they've increased but we see them all the time and like i said earlier every time there is a crisis or an opportunity you also see the potential for a scam to surface right and so we certainly do a lot of work with difta uh both um in cross training right our counselors to make sure that they are aware of like elder abuse and other issues that seniors may be facing, the, the telephone call scam about the nephew or grandchild that is potentially going to jail unless you send all this money. Um, all of those things are things that we are uh, very aware of and always trying to do education in our communities because unfortunately for some of these scams, it isn't easy to find a remedy for, it's better to prevent them, right? Um, so we have all these um, materials um, that we'll be happy to you know, work with your office and other council members to distribute them. But we've done a lot of outreach at senior centers um, and always just showing people, you know, the tools that they need to have in place in order to prevent themselves from falling into scams that you know anyone could fall prey to, right? Um, and both our financial counselors and even our free tax prep um, uh, volunteers have been key during this pandemic. And one thing that I wanted to say is that you know while we may have seen like less numbers in coming to counseling uh, or coaching, we did see an increase in the number of people who needed help with the economic stimulus payment, right? And it's certainly like, you know, we served over 10,000 individuals access, you know, uh, make sure that they had the right information so they 
qualify for the full uh, payment they were eligible for, people who maybe in the past didn't file taxes because their income wasn't high enough to require them to file taxes, but because of that, they were invisible to the government. So we did a lot of that work. And, and there are times where, you know, a, a city, um, city leaders will have to be willing to respond to the most urgent need, uh, the most urgent crisis. And I think that is certainly something that was in a lot of people's minds, right? Um, not necessarily coaching right away, but maybe how do I get the funds I need to survive, right? And so I can see why people would prioritize that and say, I'm gonna make time to talk to someone about this versus something else where I, right now, what budget am I working with if I don't have any money? So um, definitely think we need to keep working on ways of outreach. We do have a partnership with both AARP and with the FedCap uh, that are doing work for um, to make sure that uh, seniors are ac accessing uh, these tax counseling for the elderly program. So they are able to both get those economic stimulus payments and also you know, file their taxes for free. And these organizations obviously that have a lot of expertise on sort of uh, how to meet that, uh, that uh, financial divide, no, the divide, the tech divide, right? Like seniors who need access to these services, but may not have, as you said, a computer at home or a way to uh, manage that technology on their own. Uh, so certainly very open to any other suggestions you may have. Um, another thing is too that a lot of times uh, people don't know or feel like when I did my counseling, uh, financial coaching 10 years ago, I did not know of OFE. I only knew about the counselor at the nonprofit organization I was in and that was the person I knew, right? And so sometimes OFE is a little bit out of the radar for people. Um, and that's fine. We want them to recognize that community-based organization or provider as the one that they go to, they trust, because to us that is sort of bridging that gap between the government who some people find intimidating or just unresponsive and the organization that is there right next to your house or next, next to your job. I, I think like also one of the key uh, aspects that we uh, use um, to prevent scams. And as the commissioner mentioned in testimony is like, there's a reason why OFE is in DCWP um, consumer protection and financial health go hand in hand. So in addition to the programs that, uh, you know, Nicole and the, and the commissioner oversee in OFE, including free tax prep and financial counseling, we also are able to leverage uh, the resources of our work as a consumer protection agency that includes our landmark consumer protection law. Um, so it's a complement to the work, particularly with free tax prep. Our enforcement staff will go out to paid preparers, for example, and enforce uh, various consumer disclosures that prevent scamming. Um, and I think, and I know, Chair, that, that you're a co-sponsor of uh, Introduction 1622, which would be an update to our consumer protection law. That is a key piece to financial health. Um, you know, to have affirmative programming um, that the city is putting out to the constituents, but also in cases that require it, um, having strong laws that protect consumers when they go into the marketplace from being victims of predatory information, whether that's online ads or whether they're walking into a brick and mortar store and uh, are affected by price gouging or some other fashion of a, of a predatory scam. So I just want to, to, to zoom out and make sure that, um, you know, the council is aware that OFE's work and our consumer protection work are really a hand in hand uh, partnership. I appreciate that. Um, I have two more questions. And uh, after, so the, the, the moratorium, obviously the, 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 the is weighing heavily on renters, right? Um, the eviction moratorium, sorry, let me clarify. It has, does the OFE play any role or, you know, in helping New Yorkers kind of prepare for what that may be, what the impact will be to their families? Um, you know, we, we expect it to be pretty detrimental um, unless we kind of come up with creative ways to either cancel the rent or to help um, people access, renters access, um, government uh, funded programs to help pay um, rental arrears. But if, you know, if you don't have a job, you don't qualify for most of those programs. So is, is OFE playing any, any role in terms of preparing New Yorkers for what may come? 
it's a good question. I, I don't think that I can say we have, but maybe we have, and I don't know about it because my team sometimes does a lot more than I know. But let me say one thing about this, though. I know that for the existing programs, which I know are very limited, right, and have a lot of restrictions, but even those programs run through HRA, like the one shot, and I forget what the other names are, are definitely things that we had our counselors trained on so that they could if someone comes in with like, I can't pay the rent, or well, have you even tried this? Let's go for this, let's even, let's try this, right? So anything that is available, our counselors are aware of and are uh, routing people to those programs. Um, but Nicole, can you think of anything else? Um, yeah. So to add on to what the commissioner shared, every time a new option, whether it was the state eviction, um, or ex excuse me, the state rental assistance that was open for a short time, or there were several large like mutual funds or um, rental arrears, privately funded funds, uh, we would push those out to the financial counselors so that they could then share them with their organization or clients they were meeting with um, to help them put together those applications so that the client themselves could uh, apply for those things. We also, for a long time, if someone came into HRA and applied for a one-shot deal, they would refer them directly to a financial empowerment center to go hand in hand in that process. Um, we still do that as whenever possible. We have also done work to connect with home base. And in fact, we have a contract with Bronx Works and they run a home base and the financial empowerment center is co-located with that home base specifically about drawing that connection and trying to build off of that. Um, and then we do our best to connect to any public benefit or uh, public assistance, you know, benefit specialist. If someone comes in and has like a need for that, we have been working with groups like CUCS and honestly, even some of our contracted providers, Bronxworks, another example, that they provide benefits assistance as well. And so it's a great, nice synergy between, you know, the financial counseling and the other programs that they, that they offer. The last thing I would call out is that we have a very small legal contract that's attached to the financial empowerment centers to provide consumer financial, uh, to address consumer finance issues. Um, and we can do that, whether it be scams, whether it be bankruptcy, whether it be like, you know, fraud or debt cancellation that they may need to pursue to, again, try to fill in those needs. But we agree with you that the eviction moratorium is quite concerning. And um, if and when there are options to help New Yorkers avoid eviction or apply for rental assistance, we will do our best to incorporate those into our tax prep and financial counseling programs. Um, however possible. And last question, uh, in OFE's report, already at risk, the New Yorkers struggling economically before COVID-19, you provide background on the precarious uh, financial situation that many New Yorkers were experiencing prior to the pandemic. What, in your opinion, must the city do after the pandemic eventually subsides to ensure that New Yorkers do not find themselves in that situation again? And what steps must be taken to ensure that future emergencies do not emergencies do not cause as much financial damage uh, as the pandemic has? That is um, a loaded question. A big, no. big and loaded question. Um, I mean, certainly, as 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 we have seen, um, our the communities have been the most impacted, uh, disparately impacted, right? Our communities that need. Uh, huge, huge investment from our city government. Um, and I, I know that it's going to take a lot more than the resources at our agency, obviously. Um, people need uh, affordable housing, people need access to food and education and healthcare. There's just so many things that we need to bring to make sure that everyone has access to, right? Um, there are the the larger problems of like debt that we've been carrying, like our communities carry uh, a lot of our um, research around student loan debt and other debt um, have shown that a lot of uh, black borrowers and Latino borrowers are just never able to build wealth because they're carrying such large debt. 
part of it has to do also with the choices we make sometimes because we're subject to advertisements, right? Targeted advertisement that try to draw us into making some investments um, that are not necessarily as wise. So, I mean, whatever we can do as an agency to do uh, a lot of, uh, of awareness for consumers on, on how to make those decisions um, that are going to benefit you for financial help are great, but we will need bigger interventions, right? Like student loan debt is not going to go away um, unless we have a bigger action from the federal government. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with some of the the numbers that we have in the Bronx in particular, we have a lot of borrowers who have, um, are their loans are on the, in default or in, in distress and they owe less than $5,000. It's not a lot of money when you think about it, right? It's not a lot of money, but it's money that is getting in the way of them being able to um, have a credit score that allows them to qualify for affordable housing, for instance. So for many months already we've been looking at you know is there a way to pilot a program to target uh student loan debt borrowers who may be carrying a very small debt but that alone is just getting really in the way of them building assets right so um there may be some interventions that will take funding uh resources from the city but could really help people who are right now um you know just not able to get out of that situation um, and I don't know if, uh, Nicole, do you want to say something like broader towards like the work that OFE is doing? Um, yeah. So what, you know, we, we've always known the importance of savings and emergency savings. Of course, the ability to save is absolutely connected to, to one's income and one's expenses. And so, you know, whenever there are opportunities to think about equity, to think about opportunities for asset building, which can then allow someone to have a larger sort of safety cushion. Uh, those are really important to us. Looking at ways, you know, back to some of your earlier questions, Chair, when you were mentioning things like banks and access to banking, or even some of the other council members talking about fees that banks are, ch are charging, every fee adds up, especially for a family living on a fixed income. So what can we do to help New Yorkers understand those fees? you know, avoid those fees. We think about Empowered NYC. One of the most common issues was an SSA overpayment. And so that means that someone typically through a paperwork issue had more income than Social Security knew and then Social Security then requires money to be paid back. So again, that's fees. It's, it's sort of that layering on of fees that for us is a piece of financial health, knowing that you can avoid fees that you also having access to those, you know, low cost, no cost financial options, all of that sort of plays together. So when we think about, you know, an equitable, equitable city, I think about our collaborative for neighborhood financial health research that really showed the opportunity for childcare to have a trusted financial institution in your neighborhood really leads to a financially healthier neighborhood and financially healthier, you know, constituents or New Yorkers. And so, I think as often as we can advocate for some of those very positive changes, we can you know, work to update basic banking requirements, that's advocacy with the state, expand other options, um, and continue to get the message out that there are trusted resources. Um, because no matter, it does feel like no matter how many people we talk to about free tax prep, we will always meet someone who just filed their taxes and paid several hundred dollars to do it. Um, and it's just a matter of the scale of our city. And so every opportunity to get the word out, I think is an additional help to that advocacy. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. Um, I, wanna, I, I wanna just recognize that we were also joined by Council Member Perkins. Um, and I will now turn it over to CJ. Thank you, Chair. My name is CJ Murray. I'll be filling in uh, for Josh as Committee Council for the remainder of the hearing. We'll now turn to public testimony. Um, I don't see any of our registered witnesses on the call. So at this time, if you're on the call and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I'll now turn it back to Chair Ayala for closing remarks. Well, 
thank you all for coming to testify. I think that this is all, this has been a really great hearing and I think I've learned a lot and I hope that the viewers have learned a lot. Um, and I look forward to this being one of many conversations um, as we, you know, move away from, you know, the, uh, the impact of, uh, of this, this pandemic, um, most specifically on communities that have been impacted um, and are on the list of the 27, which I will assume at some point will be 32 and then, you know, we'll continue to grow um, within the next few months. But thank you all for, for coming today. And with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.